it here. And I would just really like to welcome all of you to yet another Women Lead online forum. These are kind of new for us, um, but these are brought to you by Connected Women of Influence. I'm Patty Vargas, I'm your host today, and we're delighted to bring another exciting discussion for professional women everywhere. And these online forums have been designed especially for you, for the professional, busy, leader and some of these sessions are designed to be informative where we we bring on a subject matter expert to talk about their chosen field and then other sessions are intended to be more thought-provoking conversation starters maybe talking about topics that we we don't necessarily always talk about but things that affect us all affect women uh, in business both personally and professionally but whatever it is that you're looking for you we have an online forum especially for you, have no fear. And our session today is gonna to last for about an hour. Um, if you've joined with video, you can see the panelists and the other attendees alike. Um, and questions and comments are always welcome. So anything you wanna to contribute to the conversation, I want you to consider this truly um, a conversation like we would have in person. And we've got a fabulous panel of, of great professional women that have um, agreed to kind of share their experiences along this topic. I'll be chiming in. I hope all of you guys will be chiming in as well. If we end up with a lot of folks on the call, then maybe we'll go to using the chat box. But regardless, I'll be monitoring it. And we'll, uh, if you've got a question you want to present, I'll be sure to ask it for you or a comment that you want to make. We want to hear from you. Now, our topic today in the ladies' room is called the myth of the work-life balance. And I am so excited to introduce our thought leaders today. So let me tell you a little bit about each of them. First, we have Michelle Corona, and she founded Nature's Image in 1995, and she's a successful landscape construction firm specializing in, well, she's not a firm, the company is a firm, <laughs> restoring land back to its natural habitat. And through her experience, she was able to recognize environmental sensitivity could be done along with construction activities. So in 2018, she started HANA Resources. I'm hoping I said that right. An, envi an environmental company that's dedicated to developing new technology using AI and drone technology for plant health and invasive species recognition in the environmental rehabilitation market. She graduated from Cal Poly and has a degree in environmental and systematic biology. She has two children, three dogs, one husband, and how many employees did you say? 120. <laughs> so she doesn't have anything to do. And then next we have Joylyn Darnell, and Joylyn is the Executive Director of Strategic Partnerships for National University and is the co-founder of the Institute for Leadership Synergy at National University. And in addition to her full-time responsibilities at work, Ms. Darnell is an entrepreneur by marriage. Joy Lynn and her husband, Dennis, took their idea from concept to market in three years, and they hold several patents for it. And in her free time, huh, Joy Lynn is currently pursuing her doctorate in education and leadership and teaches a weekly spin class. <laughs> she also has one son named Dakota. And then Chris Noel, our last resident expert here, has been a business owner for more than 12 years and has a beautiful mission statement. Her mission statement is empowering entrepreneurs and small businesses through financial freedom, organizational clarity, and team engagement. She's a mom, she's a wife, she's an avid reader with degrees in music education and business administration with an emphasis in accounting and HR, criminology and women's studies. And, and this is my kind of girl. In her free time, she likes to do nothing but sit by the pool with a book. <laughs> I'm there, I'm there with you. So <laughs> welcome you guys. I'm super excited to have you here on this panel. and. You know, when I was dreaming up some of these topics and, and um, some of these things came about, you know, with a few glasses of wine with Michelle and the rest of the team or, you know, just something I would read in the newspaper or a magazine or, or online that would just spark my interest and so forth. And um, somebody had said something about, you know, I'm still working on that work-life balance. And I said, oh, really? You know, well, 
tell me about that. What is it? You know, tell me about this unicorn called work-life balance. <laughs> and, you know, it, it, it occurred to me that we've been talking about this for years. I mean, I remember back in some of my earliest corporate days making New Year's resolutions that said something like, I'm not going to work as much. I'm going to spend more time at home. I'm going to begin to exercise, you know, whatever. And, you know, maybe it lasted till the end of January. Maybe it didn't ever get off the ground. And some things I was more successful, you know, for, um, you know, whatever. But uh, it just occurs to me that we still don't have this figured out. You know, we just... Uh, or maybe we do, and maybe it's unique to everybody, you know? So what do you guys think? You know, what's your, when someone says work-life balance to you, what, what do you think of? It's a little bit chaotic at all times, I would say. Um, I don't know, like, it is a myth. I don't think you can ever achieve it, but you got to find your happiness your way. And, and everyone's is different. You know, it could be reading a book by the pool that re-engages you, or it could be a walk. And I think the one thing that women struggle with is identifying what that is for them, what really rejuvenates them so they can do their best at work and at home. Mm -hmm. um, and I think sometimes we struggle identifying that because we're so busy on the hamster wheel running somewhere that, and then we just jump off in exhaustion. Yeah. And, and we really need to find ways regularly to recharge our batteries, so to speak. Right. right. And men have been doing it for years. They go play golf on Sunday. Uh -huh. <laughs> or they go play, my husband loves to play poker, so he goes Friday night to play poker. You know, they, yeah. they always have naturally had more of a built-in release, I think. And women, we haven't kind of figured out what that looks like as, as well as they have. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, just just building on what Michelle was saying, I think, like when the when it get the most stressed or the most overwhelmed, that's when like the breaks are most needed. But yeah. you have this sense that like you have to keep working, but the reality is you're actually more effective and more productive if you take a break. Right. But we're not used to that, and so part of it for me has been being really honest about okay, this is a time I'm in overload. This is the time that I need to take that that 20 minutes or that half an hour. And then also I schedule, you know, I started scheduling exercise on my outlook calendar. Mm -hmm. Like this is the appointment to myself. Yeah. Yes. And this is the one I need to keep because this is the one that keeps yeah. you from going crazy. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. if we go crazy, everyone around us is going to go crazy. Yeah. And they, they, they're much happier <laughs> that out on the exercise, you know, instead of them. So I think, I think that for me is just being more, um, you know, I used to feel like that was selfish or I used to feel like that was like, I was a slacker, you know, and now I'm like, no. And, and, and I think I watch like my boss, like when the meeting ends, he gets up and he walks out. And if yeah. that time it was scheduled to, he goes and, yeah. and I, no regret. Like he, I don't see this sense like he needs to sit there and own like everyone else feeling better, you know, but I feel that like I need to own, is everyone good? Is everyone, you know, like, <laughs> That's so, true. Yeah. So I think for me, it's a little bit like, okay, it's kind of a boundary issue. It's like, this is reasonable. I've done the work and now I need to take care of me and so that I can be my best self. Yeah. That's legitimate. I love that idea of, of boundaries, you know, because um, I too would schedule breaks and, you know, whatever exercise or meditation or, you know, whatever on my calendar. And then it, convince myself it was okay to break it because it was only a date with me you know it didn't really matter i could give it up for something else and mm -hmm. and that was poor boundaries that was just you know um, i used to work for this guy that i swear to god the building could be on fire and at noon he would reach down and pick up his gym bag and walk out the door and you'd be like what what <laughs> And, and who was I to say that's wrong? You know, I mean, he had very good boundaries, you know, I, I sometimes I thought he could have broken them, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. But, but the thing is, is that's the difference. Like, yeah. and there's no, they don't feel guilty and we feel guilty or we feel, we question or we cancel art. But the thing is, I think what I've started to realize is that when I take that break, I come back to the work and I'm actually more effective. 
Mm -hmm. So I think that's the difference is like, you're actually going to be more productive if you step away at lunch or you get that recharge. So that's the difference. You know, I think we have this notion that geniuses sat at their desks all day, 20 hours. That's not true. You know, they walk, they break, they they recharge. And I think we're finding that out. So, you know, so if you work in a system where it's about how, how productive you are and having new ideas and fresh ideas and being innovative and things, Mm -hmm. those are going to come when you step away and get a different shift of your perspective. I go from a different angle. I gladly say I'm I'm a recovering workaholic. Um, I, being an entrepreneur, I agree with all this. When we leave, we don't actually ever leave. We never clock out. We're always on it. We're always trying to figure out new things, take care of people shit hits the fan. We're the ones accountable. Mm -hmm. So, um, and, and overseeing staff and, you know, um, the challenges that come with that. I would just say I'm recovering workaholic. I think though, the best thing for me with the innovation is realizing that, um, like you said, boundaries, when you create boundaries, um, and you hold them, it creates a safe space for you. So even with my children, we have weekly one-on-ones, very intentional with the time that we spend with our children. Um, so my husband and I, they're in the calendar. Our children hold us accountable. Um, if you're familiar with EOS Traction, we even hold level 10s at our home where it's an hour and a half meeting where we have a scorecard and check in with the chores and that sort of thing, that it just creates a level of accountability at home that we have with our teams at the office. Um, and for me, that was so freeing because I, um, I will put people in the pit of despair all the time because I'm a creative personality that I want new things. I try new things. Being consistent is very hard for me. So, um, with this, it's created boundaries. And for my husband, um, while he has no problem saying no to people, he's really helped me, um, work on that. So I have a different thing where he's been such a source of strength for me, where I say, Hey, I'm really struggling with these priorities. Could you help me? And, um, he's like, well, what, you know, so he goes through and, uh, we, we IDS on that. But, um, to me, it's, it's, I've been surrounded by women, um, pretty much my entire career. Most of our team is um, women because we empower women. It's one of our our niche statements, a lot like CWI. So I don't have a whole lot of, and my mom was the breadwinner when we grew up. My dad was the stay-at-home dad. So for me, I've I've lived a different life um, that I've realized as I've grown up is very different than a lot of humans. Um, So uh, to me, the work-life balance is always just super being super intentional with what's in the calendar and sticking to it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And keeping um, like each of you have all just said, calendaring things um, and staying really organized has to, it becomes a bigger and bigger priority because time you can't get back. Right. Mm-hmm. We have to be to your point, Chris, very intentional with how we're utilizing that time. And, one thing I think I struggled with um, is understanding that you can't get that back and making sure that you are spending time and where you want to spend time. And for a while when my kids were younger, I, I don't think I was as intentional with where I was spending my time with them or how I was doing it. Mm-hmm. And as they got older and I got older. I learned to really value certain things more so than just we're spending time together. What are we doing? How does this interaction work out? What are we each trained to learn from each other? Of course, you always want just together time, right? You still need to just be and hang out. Um, But I I think calendaring those things and recognizing time, your time is so valuable and that you can't, if you're gonna take away an hour of my workday and I can't go for my hour walk that I go to every day, you know, there's a problem and mm-hmm. creating that is so important. Mm-hmm. So to yeah. completely agree with that. Mm-hmm. You know, um, it's interesting what, what you said, Chris, about your, your mom and your dad. Um, I, I consider my dad sort of my first role model, I guess, in, in business. And, and my dad was a workaholic. Now, as a, as a kid, um, I only have my perception was, you know, that he worked a lot. He worked, you know, was gone most of the time in the morning when I got up and didn't come home until late. Um, Dinner was, you know, frequently late. Um, 
and all of that. And, and, you know, as a kid, I mean, who knows why he worked that way, you know, but to me, he was just a workaholic. And that was what was modeled for us. And my sister, my brother and I are all three, we tend to be workaholics. And, um, but I, sometimes I felt like, um, and I, I felt this with me, like sometimes I'll just be in, in the zone as I'm just really enjoying what I'm doing so much that I don't want to stop. I'm actually enjoying what I'm doing and I don't want to stop and take a break and I don't want to, um, you know, I'm just enjoying it, you know? So I, I start wondering, do we, do we determine for ourselves? Is it up to each individual to say, what's my work-life balance? You know, what's, how much time do I work? How much time do I carve out for me? How much time do I carve out for my family or, or what have you? You know, is that just a, is that just different for everybody and not necessarily something that you can push on somebody else? I think it's absolutely all different, right? Mm -hmm. Every one of us, like I wouldn't describe myself as a workaholic at all, but I am always working because I, I enjoy it right? I'll read a business book on the weekends. Yeah, I'll be working on something, but that's because that's bringing me joy, right? Right. And even consider that work time. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And so, it, so I completely think that every one of us and how we balance our lives and where we want to spend our time is so individual. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a lot of people that would never be able to start a business, take care of kids, be married. And that's perfectly fine because they know that where we've decided, hey, we're, we want all of this. Mm -hmm. And when you've got a lot of balls in the air, then you have to figure out, okay, how am I going to continue to maintain this, right? And, and create that. And like you, Patty, my dad was the breadwinner. Mm -hmm. Mom was a stay-at-home mom. And so I was like, I, I, I never understood the stay-at-home thing. And I, and I grew up in that traditional format. Right, right. Um, so everybody's just different and built differently. Mm -hmm. That's how I feel. Yeah. I, I just wanted to add to that. I think you hit on something there, Patty, about when you're in the zone, when you're doing work. That, see, so I think it's almost like the word work. Like something like 70% yeah. of Americans don't like their job. Okay, that's yeah. work to me. Yeah. But when you find something that you you get into that flow. To me, right. that's getting a more alignment about purpose and about what fulfills you. Mm -hmm. So then maybe it's not so much work, but it's what, what charges you and what makes you feel good. And so then you want to spend more time doing that, but it's not like this negative, right? So I yeah. think it's, it's so, to me, it's like this bigger thing, right? It's like, if you, if you think more deeply, if we're just going to work and we're just fill in the time and we're not happy that's one piece but I think if you're if you're asking yourself honestly more about what fulfills you what makes you happy or in the end you know where is the time spent that makes it meaningful to you and you're working in a place that that's that's that to me it's not really work maybe that's more about purpose and so I'm thinking more about alignment and if you can bring those things that you're passionate about into you know quote unquote your work then I don't know that it's such a bad thing. I don't, I don't think, you know what I'm saying? And you, you're actually, you're refilling yourself by doing what you love, but there's probably parts about your work that you love less, you know? Yeah. So then can you delegate those things? And so that you're not working 24 seven, you're just really into the things that you love the most. And then some of those other things we let go and, and go to the gym or the walk or whatever, right? Patty, I really like your question there if it's individual because I work probably about 50 hours a week. My sweet spot is 20, um, but I love helping people and aligning. And more importantly, I always do a check-in with my children. Hey, what does it look like to be on the other side of me right now? Because while I love what I do, they're my priority while they're young. And I want to know what it's like to be on the other side. And if they say, mom, you're working way too much. You've missed three of my games this week. I really wanted you to be there. Then I adjust my work schedule and count on the team a little bit, like Joylyn said, and delegate and elevate other people. Um, but yeah, I think it's different to everybody. Some people love working 60, 70, 80, 90, 120 hour work weeks. I am not one of those. Um, and so I, I think it is completely individualized on what people are looking for and wanting. Yeah. And I think sometimes when you work for yourself or um, 
you know, or you work from home, it, it, things get blurred. You know, Adrienne, I know that that you guys work, you know, from home, and um, you know, we'll find ourselves sitting on the couch with our laptops, mm -hmm. and it's like we, the day is over. We've already finished working, but because we both work from home, you just pick it up and you carry it over. You're sitting on the couch, you're watching Survivor <laughs> or whatever, you know, and you're 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 doing mindless work and. Uh, we're like, no, stop that. So Adrian, what about, what about you? Is that, have you found a way of not doing that or you love um, doing it or we, we have, to, we are more disciplined about it. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's him asking. <laughs> um, we, we, we do have a special, you know, we do have an office in the house and, um, try to not really do too much if i'm on my laptop downstairs on the couch hopefully it's because i'm streaming something fun to watch <laughs> um and tony's really good i'm bad about if it's on my mind and i'm already thinking about the next day when i go to bed and i start saying something and he's like write it down we'll talk about it tomorrow nice. wow. work and it's a good reminder because I can be like, oh, 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 um, when things are really busy and stressful and it's on my mind and okay, fine. Yes, I'll write it down. We'll slate it for tomorrow. Yeah. So it's a good reminder. And it is, it's just a different discipline. Mm -hmm. You should get your husband with Chris's husband. They, they can write a book or something or teach a class. <laughs> yeah. Well, how about the rest of you guys? Margarita, Christine, what have you got to chime in to, to this? Hi, Penny, it's Margarita. Yeah, how you doing? Uh, good. Hi, everybody. Hello. Uh, thank you for letting me join you all. Um, I'm listening to this all, and then I'm sitting here thinking, oh, my gosh, you know, my day is um, – so I'm kind of in a, a – I'm that people pleaser. So I just, you know, I put everybody's first. And today I was thinking about it. Um, today there was a, a day of spending the day at the zoo. So I made lunches. Um, and what I didn't do was make my own lunch. I just put <laughs> turkey and I'm like, oh my gosh, I forgot to put the rest of my lunch. And you know, it was just turkey. So I was like, good thing I packed enough fruit for everybody. So you know, I got to munch on that. But um, you know okay so you know that's my full day i'm done and then i'm here in uh secluded as you can all see the background i hope not it's too messy um, i'm in my room and i'm like on this you know call and then after that i'm gonna start you know buckling down and doing some work so you know i work a lot of hours but i always put myself last mm -hmm. and so when I hear about the boundaries I wrote some stuff down I really like I need to put um, appointments for exercise um, talking about boundaries I try to set boundaries but I always break them I mean I'm not good at sticking to them and um, that really caught my ears today was the alignment and the flow of enjoying what I do so um, I'm gonna take a look at that mm -hmm. after today <laughs> Mm -hmm. So thank you all. Yeah, I love that word alignment. Um, Christine wrote in the chat box. I agree. It's an individual thing. My mother was also the breadwinner in our family. That, I, that's so interesting. Mm. I love that. I can be a workaholic, but I have gotten better about prioritizing, making sure that everything I commit to aligns with my higher purpose. Mm. That's amazing. Good mm -hmm. for you, Christine. Yeah. But, you know, I, I spent a lot of years, um, feeling uh, the pressure to, you know, to, to perform and, and, you know, I was really proud of how much I could produce in, in a short amount of time and um, until I, I read a book and I can't remember what the book was, if it was something by Tom Peters or what, but just about the idea of the law of diminishing returns that, you know, yeah, you've put in eight hours, you put in 10 hours, you put in 12 hours, you're still sitting there and it's seven o'clock, it's eight o'clock, it's nine o'clock, but you just have to finish this one more thing and you're not 
you know, you're not any good at what you're doing because you've been working for so long. The longer you're at it, the worse, you know, you actually get. And what was surprising to me was that I would recognize this in my staff. You know, I, I could see them getting tired and burnout out and less efficient um, at what they were doing and tell them to go home or take a break or I don't want to see you tomorrow in the office or, or what have you. But for me, it was... No, I was different. I could work seven days a week. There was no problem with that, you know, and go to school and raise a family and, you know, do all this because I am woman, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so what makes us think we can do that? I mean, why, who told us that? Where did that come from? Well, and I'll chime in because my kids are, uh, my daughter just graduated and she's my youngest and my son's a second year of uh, they're almost starting this third year of college. Mm -hmm. And I, I think from their perspective, they see a positive role model, right? They see that it's okay to work, but that I need to be supported too. I can't do 100% of everything well mm -hmm. at any given time. I, I can't be the one that's making brownies with cute faces on it to bring to class. That's not, I can't do that because I'm choosing not to. Now, if I enjoyed cooking and making the fancy cupcakes and delivering them to class, then I think that's great. Yeah. But they knew that if it didn't come out of Giardelli's box of uh, brownies from Costco, that's, that's the extent of what mom could deliver, right? And I don't think they missed out on that. They just knew that that was where my line was or where, what I was willing to do. Um, and I, for my priorities with the kids, like I wouldn't miss their, like games for me was mm -hmm. pretty for them. And I had to define what it looked like. And everyone has to define what that is because we are all so different of how we work and how we do things. And I guess the word work in and of itself, and Jolyn, uh, you already mentioned this. I don't like the business was like my first child in so many ways mm -hmm. that I don't even sometimes consider work, the word work. I consider it something that I, I want to excel at. I want to make it better. What can I do to make this mousetrap better? And so <clears throat> I think that's the, the part that we all kind of have to understand is is the purpose, the alignment, all those words that we can do to define what we're doing and just remember the importance of what it means for us. Because we, I can spend a lot of time doing laundry, but is that my best use of time? <laughs> you know, or I can, I can delegate that one yeah. off. You know, you have to kind of figure out what that is. And sometimes some weeks are great and some weeks aren't as good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Delegation part, right? And so you have to kind of find what those pieces are. And I think you have to have support. Mm -hmm. You have to be supported somewhere. Totally. Oh my, yeah. uh, you know, with either cooking, cleaning, <laughs> shop, grocery shopping, whatever it is, making lunches. You know, you, I would gain weight if I didn't bring lunch, right? Because you go out and that's the worst thing I can do. So anyway, those are just some more thoughts on that. I just kind of building on what Michelle's saying. I mean, it's hysterical. Like I, I just, I'm a bad cook. Like, that's it. <laughs> you, know? yes. so, you and me you know, both. And my, and my husband's a good cook, you know, but we don't have time. And uh, so we started doing like, you know, different delivery things where the food comes mm -hmm. or I, I figured out Instacart. I don't go to Costco anymore, but it's funny because I'll talk to friends and they're like, oh, I'd love to go to Costco. I'd rather be dead than be at Costco. <laughs> you know, but I have friends that would love to go to Costco. But I, that's to me is repeat. It's the same task over and over. If, like, so I look for, hey, can I just order this on my iPad at Target and just run in and pick it up. So I think it kind of comes back to what do you like? And I don't, I'm not, you know, I have a friend that loves to cook and she's a great cook and that's important to her. And so I said, you know, just because I don't cook doesn't mean that we don't have quality family dinner time. It doesn't matter what we're eating. We are always together. We are always sitting down. We are always connecting. So in, and then I'm not preparing and I'm not washing dishes after and I'm not prepping and I'm not doing all the other stuff. So I think it has to do with what, you know, what fulfills you and what you love, but it doesn't mean that you don't have, I think that Chris kind of mentioned that about intention. It's like, if you're really intentional about that time with your family, mm -hmm. it's, it's not, you know, it's about that you're focused on them. 
and that you're not on your phone and that you're not half distracted, right? That's what they want. And so we can be doing anything as long as we're together and we're connected, right? But I, I agree. I just, I delegate all that stuff. And if I cook, I'm kind of a disaster anyway. My husband's like, I'd just rather eat grilled cheese if you're happy. <laughs> I'm grilled cheese. Like he's, but I, so that's your point about support. That's a big piece. I mean, I think you have to have a spouse or a partner or family. And some of that's good because I feel like if I was available, you know, I enable. I mean, if I'm available to do the work, everybody's going to let me do the work. But now I'm not. So it's kind of nice. And it kind of goes back to that boundary conversation. It's like, guess what? Mom's got to study. So I need your help folding clothes. That's it. You know, you're six. You can help fold clothes. So yeah. it's, it's kind of coming back to how can everybody participate and pitch in. And um, and that kind of traditional sense that mom has to do everything. I think, again, we, I think we, some of us, we have to ask for help, too, which is hard. It is hard right? It's like, I need help here. So Patty, if I go back to your question on what made us believe we have to do it all or are capable of doing it all, um, I'm going to say like how we're born, right? Our DNA, there's people who are achievers, there's people who are nurturers, there's people who are rock. It's all different things um, that I would say. And here um, with all of us, how many... Um, so we didn't hand things off and I think like anything else it's a skill you learn so I talk about achievers and delegate and grocery shopping and cooking it's all skills so going back to your question Patty like why do we believe it it's hundreds of years of society <laughs> I mean if you look at it it's not been that long that women have had to vote that women have had the ability to work that mm -hmm. women um and all of that right so I think a lot of us are really starting to push the boundaries on the norms um and in order to do so we have to show we're better show we're stronger um and I know my mom she my both my parents are entrepreneurs as well but um my mom is a she writes I can't think right now, but so she would go into a heavily dominated field and the way that um, and we're, we're fighting for it. But the way to fight for it, too, is to make sure that we're putting on our best to put our best foot forward every time. Right. Because you still need to raise kids that can take care of themselves, right? that they can be independent and successful. And and that it takes a lot of work right? Just as much work as it takes to run a business, yes. you know, and, and, and where you're going to spend your time to make sure that they can excel, that you're teeing them up for success. Just like you mentioned, you're teeing up your staff, right? Mm -hmm. You have to delegate to them. You have to manage them. You have to give them a bar so they can achieve something more, mm -hmm. um, give them a career path, whatever it may be. Uh, so no, I think that's a, a very good point that we're kind of we've kind of glossed over. I remember my mom couldn't even get a credit card in her name in the seventies and yeah. we were in foreign countries and she would have to go to the bathroom and pull cash out of her bra, like wads <laughs> wow. of cash so we could get an airplane ride to the next place. Yeah. <laughs> oh that was, that's not that long ago. Yeah. yeah you know, when I, I went through my uh, divorce in 95 and, um, I couldn't close credit card accounts without his permission. And it was, it was such a shock to me, you know, that um, especially since, um, see ya, Adrienne, have fun. Um, since, well, I mean, it just was, it was really a shock to me that I couldn't do a whole lot of things without his permission in 1995. So. Yes. Yeah. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. Even now when we show up places and we're inducing, because um, uh, TNT, my husband's not a part of, but they'll still talk to him first before they talk to me. And he has to go, nope, that's my wife's business. I, I show up and I support her, but you need to know, yeah. go to her. So, And my mom's a pilot. And anytime we talk about it, they'll always assume that my dad's the pilot. So I still think there's this stigma that we're working against at this point. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I could keep going. I'll, I'll go into meetings now. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> the same thing. I have a, my COO is a male that's tall and big and middle-aged and everyone talks to him. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
you yeah. know, and I don't necessarily need to correct them. If they can't figure it out, they're probably not a vendor I want to be part of anyway. <laughs> Let them fall on their sword and I can walk out and he can deal with that. <laughs> there you you know, that, that, that kind of stuff still happens. That's perfect. Yeah. yeah. If you're, if you're really that uneducated yeah. about the business you're coming into, then that's, that's on you. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, we are being biased mm-hmm. and, and we're part of it too. I mean, yeah. There's still that bias us, I'm sure, too, as much as we are aware of it. But my daughter doesn't have it. You know, she, you know, feels she can do anything. And that's what you want, right? Right. You, you want to make sure that free, clear mind that she can do anything. She can open up a bank account and do whatever she wants. You yeah. Know? And whatever she wants and be successful at it. Yeah. Um, but she might only be the only one in the programming room too, because there's not that many women in the STEM field. Mm-hmm. Still, yeah, still, yeah. You know, uh, some of you may know Linda Amaro from CWI in San Diego, and I used to work for Linda years ago, a uh, long, long time ago. And at the time I worked for her, she was the VP of operations for a company, and she would answer the phone, you know, if she answered the phone and they would ask if they could speak to her boss, you know, so this is back in the nineties, you know, and she would say, sure, just a minute. Then she'd put them on hold. Then she'd pick up the phone again. (laughs) It was so funny. We used to have all kinds of jokes about that, about, you know, how did you get to be, you know, an operations director or a VP of operations in a tech company, you know, back then. So she made a hell of a cup of coffee that's what it was yes (laughs) you know Michelle I wanted to go back to something you said um, a while back about um, that you thought you were a really good role model for your kids and that they know you can't they know you work hard and they know that you're talented and they know you're smart and they also know that you can't do it all that you need help and and joy when you said the same thing about you know your six-year-old can fold his own clothes and things so did you guys tell your kids this did you was it modeled for them was it sort of like sit down and make expectations about this is what this is how this family functions what how did you manage that any of you anyone who did that well because i i don't know that i did well, and I don't know if I did it well either. I mean, you know, you'd have to ask my kids that question. Um, but I, the one thing I didn't do, um, I didn't know about EOS and traction until recently. So, Chris, it sounds like you implemented that at home. I never have. I think that's a brilliant idea. I wrote that down already. Um, but for me, I think it was just more that, there's so much, there's only so many hours in the day and I don't know how I'm supposed to, how do I watch your game and then have dinner on the table when the game's over? <laughs> you, you, you explain the math to me on that one. <laughs> and so I think it happened more um, organically versus kind of like lengthy discussions. Um, as my kids got older, I started telling them like maybe a problem I would have at work so I could say this is what's on my mind you know kind of like hey how was school you know well this is what my day happened you know i had somebody file a fraudulent workers comp claim they said they fell down when Mm -hmm. when them fall and you know whatever it may be right and so we started having more honest conversations about what i do Mm -hmm. and and the problems or challenges that i face or maybe an employee suddenly quit a big project now all boots on the ground right and and he's like oh okay I understand that you know now I understand we have to work late tonight because of this situation so I for me it was definitely more just organic um, as things kind of happened through our lives and their lives Mm -hmm. because their schedules change so much which means your schedule changes a lot Mm -hmm. (laughs) I found it there never there's never this perfect week where I can work out six days a week and then I have perfect meals, you know, six days a week and the kids are not driving me nuts or this isn't happening. And you just, I, I find you just have to roll with it. You know, you're going to make yourself crazy trying to create a perfect family, a perfect this. Yeah. I just laugh at 
I, shit just happens and yeah. you got to figure out how to deal with it and you have to just let it roll off because mm-hmm. um, that's just life yeah you know yeah in our family, um, my kiddos, as soon as we did the startup, they've come with me for everything. We homeschooled, so um, they went to a lot of business partners. They've come to a lot of conferences. Um, you know, my all of them speak the language of everything, so that's a thing. But then for us, is it five years ago, I had a traumatic brain injury um, where I was basically in a coma for six months. And at that point, a lot of them had to grow. My youngest was two at the point at that point. So a lot of pictures of her just sitting on the bed while I'm asleep. Um, at that point, they had to grow up quite a bit and had to work with dad to, to get things doing. Um, at least at that point, you know, our team was really functioning pretty solid without me, which is the sign, right, that you've done things well. <laughs> so pat on my back for that. But, um, but for us, that's what it really looked like. So um, while we have been really intentional. So now probably for about two years, I've been seizure free and really able to jump back into it. And so my kids, have st- they still come with us on everything. They, they know our staff, they do every, our business partners, they do everything with me. So I think that's made it a whole lot easier um, because even at this point, my oldest 14, we're about to launch his first business. Um, so that's really, we modeled by doing basically. Yeah. So my six-year-old, she does her laundry too, right? It's the cutest thing to watch her measure and pour the detergent, wash it, dry it, <laughs> all that sort of stuff. Even right now, she's reminding me we have an appointment to go through too. <laughs> so um, yeah. no, we've just made it so much part of it, and I own every weakness I have. I just and I think that's brought um, a lot of, you know, um, it's made things. So much easier and I by no means am I perfect um, at all I drop the ball quite a bit but I think really including them in what we're doing like Michelle said has been beautiful and helped us as we've recovered from quite a few things yeah that's good good for you guys Mm -hmm. yeah Uh, amazing um I think our experience has been kind of this this is basically the same I mean we we kind of we came up with this product and we decided to manufacture it in China so we took our son to China at, at age three and my, my mom called and said, do you know how far it is to go to China? <laughs> you know? like, I'm like, yeah, it's actually easier than driving to Tucson. <laughs> you know, and she was like, really? And, you know, so you're, you know, it's like, that's a bias and a fear. And, you know, and we took them to China. And so, you know, so I, I love what you're saying, Chris, about, so for us, like, we have a 3D printer in the house now. And, and when he sits in front of it, like other kids look at cookies baking, he looks at the 3D printer printing. Yeah. You know, and so it's about so last summer when he fell in love with fishing, they jumped on the YouTube video. They figured out how to make their first fishing lure. They created the mold. They poured the lure. I mean, so he's at five and he's designing something. And so I feel like, you know, you sharing your passion and what you're interested in. And so helps get them excited and, and you're teaching them those skills. And so we're always kind of joking around. About, what product are you going to invent? You know, <laughs> like yeah. this is how it works. And, but also really, I love, I saw the theme for both Michelle and Chris about the honesty, about, you know, the organic conversations. I mean, we've just started, like, this is where I failed, or this is where it got tough, mm-hmm. or this is where persist, those stories of persistence and grit, like, we can't pave the road in front of them. Yeah. So we have to focus on teaching them the skills to deal and cope, right? Yeah. Resilient. And so I think that's something, you know, the previous helicopter parents have kind of, done you know try to clear the path instead of prepare the kids so I think lately I've been trying to talk about where I, ha- I really had a struggle and how I had to you know stick in it in the moment and how it was hard and focus on that and how I had to overcome so it's not just about the easy stuff but it's really about how do we deal with the tough stuff and yeah. um, and having those you know we have a little a kind of a thing called policies so we set some policies around the house and it's like okay well before the tv comes on at night we gotta have the teeth brush you know that's a policy and my six-year-old just digs that he's like mom he's like we have a policy we have to brush our teeth <laughs> on tv there's so great when this kid comes back with you with that's the policy you know it's we have a 90 day policy if you don't have receipts 90 day you know it's so I think that kind of gives you a tool to set those boundaries these are the policies of our family and I think 
you know, you can make them up on the fly, but you can also be intentional. It's like, this is, you know, on New Year's Day, we're going to sit down and we're going to write out our resolutions for the whole year. And then once a quarter, we're going to pull out our phones at lunch and we're going to go through those resolutions and say, how are we doing on those resolutions? That's our, that's our family policy, you know, we, so there can be things that you value that you can create policies around and kind of make it fun and and then kids get into it because that's, that's our policy that's what we do you know and yeah. i think it can be fun and that's eo extraction right there yeah. <laughs> <That's what laughs> yeah, I, yeah you have to teach me more that's that's what what <laughs> i love this you know because i think that um i, I think we've learned so much over the years, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm older than, than you guys, but, um, I think through trial and error, you know, we've learned some things and, and often you have to get sick or you have to have some traumatic thing happen before you go, Oh, wow, this is, this is not working or, or my priorities are out of whack or, or, you know, whatever. So it's great that we, you know, that you guys seem to have, picked up on this and learned it ahead of time and actually built it into the way that you're living your life. And I love that idea of, you know, sharing with your kids something that's going on. This is a problem I'm having at work, or this is, you know, um, this is a, a where I failed instead of waiting till they're older, like, you know, sheltering them from everything. And then when they're old, let me tell you about this time, you know, that, it happens. So I think that's one great way to, to maybe maintain that balance and that idea of, of balance and bringing them into your world. Yeah, it definitely makes it interesting for sure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, because then they'd like to remind you of your failures too. <laughs> get older. My, you know, remember that time at work when you did this? Oh, yeah, I do. I remember. I've had a few of those. One too many, actually. Yeah. Um, but I also think I have, you have to laugh at yourself. Mm -hmm. well, and because I have done some really stupid things, but <laughs> it, it wasn't that I meant to do it or I thought at the time that was a great decision, but sometimes you fall and it's, you know, as they say, you learn the most from your failures than you do from your successes. Oh, yeah. 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 Um, you know, I am, I have an MBA in work experience. I'm not in education because mm -hmm. I know how to run a business. Mm -hmm. um, but you learn, you got to learn. And that, that's kind of fun now, right? You, you have to make it fun. Like yeah. brushing your teeth before the TV, you make it fun. <laughs> You know, and then they're like, cool. And that's kind of what we have to do for ourselves, right? Yeah. Because working out isn't necessarily always, oh, I can't wait. Let's do it. <laughs> it's more of, wow, I feel really good after. After. Yeah. You know, you know? and that and that makes me feel good. Right. So we, we're just like that, right? Yeah. The um, reward. What about, what if you discovered that you maybe, or, or tell us about a time that you decided you couldn't do something that you, you know, for whatever reason, you just need to cut that out. You need to stop that. Um, it, it, either it's not the time or it's not in alignment or um, whatever. It, at the time that you made a decision that something had to go. Hmm. I think for me, it was after the head injury. And I know that um, both Michelle and Joylin have said this. It was cooking dinner. Um, at that point, like, oh, one side of my body was paralyzed and the other hand I was walking with a cane. So I like physically couldn't cook dinner anymore. And I am someone who loves to cook. Like it was a pride and joy that I was putting these nutrients into my children. Um, but at that point, you know, it was causing me to have anxiety attacks that I could no longer do this anymore for the family. Um, and my husband was like, whatever, we'll just order pre-cut stuff and we'll get this and we'll get that. Like, I don't know why this is such a big deal to you. And I was like, because it's something that was so important to me that I love doing. And now mm -hmm. I'm less than because I can't anymore. Mm -hmm. um, and it took probably about a year to finally be okay that I couldn't do it. But in that time, right, we had Matt, my oldest, who started cooking dinners and loved everything about it and researching and grocery shopping and all that sort of stuff. Um, so now even at this point, it's been a while, I can still only do two meals a week. Um, but at that point, it was something like, no you're not going to do this anymore. You're going to let it go. Um, and as you can tell, I'm still like, I'm still trying to let it go, but I did have to stop and we do buy pre-cut stuff and pre-washed 
veggie, whatever. I do take the <laughs> route at this point. Yeah. Well, and I also think, Chris, you, I'm, you know, I, I uh, my heart goes out to you and your family, what you went through and to recognize that you had to, you you went through a grieving process of not being able to do something you enjoyed and you're and you, to a certain extent are still going through that. Yeah. yeah. I think for women, we don't take time out to say, wow, that really, that really hurts me. And that is upsetting and to kind of process it. Mm-hmm. And it, time to process something like that and and that's not necessarily a bad thing it's just that you need to get up in the morning and still put one foot in front of the other right and I think that you probably really role model to your children but also to yourself how well how resilient you were right to go back to Joylyn's point of resiliency and grit um yeah that's what it's all about is can you gut it out yeah. It's just, can you gut it out? <laughs> yeah. At the end of the day, you know. Like the something she loved. I mean, that's that's a different. Yeah. Like for me, you and me, it's kind of like something we're like stoked to get out of, yeah. you know? <laughs> I mean, you and me you know? both. But for her, it's maybe a part of her even identity, like how she yes. was loving her family through that. You know, like I, I have a good friend who loves to cook, and that's the way she sees it. She, this is how she loves her family, like doing this. So. Like yeah. that's a really, that's a tough, like a really tough thing. But, but I think sometimes you realize like your family, you can check in with them. Like what's the story that you're telling yourself? And even though you're not cooking them, they still know, they still know that you love yes. them. And I think sometimes we have to check in with the stories that we have in our mind because we think, well, because we didn't make dinner, you know, we didn't show that we love them or something. But I think if we ask them, do you, do you think that I, I'm not loving you if I don't make you dinner? They just say, no, like you said, your husband's like, well, we have a way around that. But that's a part of how you, you know, what you value, what you feel like you, you brought to your family. And so I think it's just checking in on that. And, but you have to still figure out a way to fill, fill that bucket for, for you. Cause it feels like, it sounds like that's more of a fulfilling piece for you. So that's a little bit different, right? Yeah. Yes. And for them, they don't care if we eat tacos every day of the week or cereal <laughs> or whatever. It didn't affect them really. Yeah. Um, right. So. Yeah. The story yeah. I'm telling myself, it was, yeah. So that's great verbiage. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's great. Well, you guys have been um, really wonderful. You've been inspirational to me and, and I've loved hearing your stories and uh, I've loved the sharing that's been, been going on here and, um, I, I just, uh, any last words, any last things you'd like to leave the audience with or, or the folks that will listen to this later in the recording? Um, I, can, I, I would just, oh, go ahead, stuff. Chris. Oh, Margarita, feed yourself. <laughs> 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 Got to keep that energy going. I'm sending you love and strength and food right now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yes, I think all women need to be kinder and more supportive yeah. for each other. I think we need to support each other um, and recognize that we all are trying to, our goals might be slightly different, but we're really just trying to do what we need to as a family and what we think is best and to support each other because we're all different and that's okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. But us women have to stick together. <laughs> yeah, that's for sure. I, I just want to say that I feel so empowered by listening to you all and what you had said. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I feel like once I get done with this, I'm like, <laughs> okay, I'm going to go take a shower. You know, everything's, <laughs> tomorrow's going to be a better day. It will be for sure. <laughs> Me first. <laughs> there you go. I like it. I love Thank it. Thank you. All right. Well, thanks so much, you guys. It's been really, really wonderful. I've loved having you on the program. And uh, for those that were with us, thank you so much for being with us. And anyone who listens to this in the the playback, uh, you know, I hope that you get as much out of it as we did while we were having it. Um, And be sure to watch the Connected Women of Influence Facebook page and LinkedIn page for the next ones that are coming up. uh, And join us for the next one. So in the meantime, I want to thank Michelle, Joylyn, and Chris for being my special, extra special guests today. And I look forward to the next time that we're all together. Thank you, Patty. Thank That's you. Have a great Take care. Yeah. Thank you all. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.